Hello, everyone. Could I have your attention, please? Thank you all very much for coming today to attend this roundtable on gender and populist nationalism in Asia. I'm Liz Perry, director of the Harvard Yenjing Institute, and uh, I'm very happy to welcome you this afternoon. Um, let me first begin with a little bit of background on this roundtable event, which is actually the 12th annual Harvard Yenjing Roundtable. And uh, every year, the Harvard Yenjing Institute sponsors a distinguished scholar from Asia uh, as a keynote speaker at the annual meeting of the Association for Asian Studies. The Association for Asian Studies, as many of you know, is the primary academic and professional association for the study of Asia. It has uh, about 6,500 members worldwide, which makes it the largest area studies organization in the world. And every spring, the AAS convenes an annual meeting somewhere or other in North America, usually in the US, sometimes in Canada, um, it just concluded its most recent annual meeting in Seattle. And then right after the conclusion of the AAS annual meeting, the Harvard Yenjing Institute invites the keynote speaker from Asia, whom we sponsored at the AAS annual convention, to come here to the Harvard campus to participate in an interdisciplinary roundtable on a topic of some public interest that intersects in some way or another with that keynote speaker's own areas of interest. Uh, this year, the Harvard Yenjing Institute uh, sponsored as keynote speaker at the AAS annual meeting in Seattle, uh, Professor Tanika Sarkar here uh, to my left, a very distinguished historian of modern India, who is known among many other things for her pathbreaking work on gender and Hindu nationalism. And I'm very grateful that she was willing to fly not only all the way from Delhi to Seattle, but also all the way from Seattle to Boston uh, to join us uh, here today at Harvard. Um, Professor Sarkar will be joined by three other outstanding scholars working on three different countries in Asia, Korea, Japan, and China. Uh, our Koreanist, who I'll introduce each of them a little bit more later on, but just to give you our pr a preview, our Koreanist, is a gender studies scholar at the University of Iowa, um, Professor uh, Heiwal Che. Our Japan uh, specialist is a sociologist at the University of Tokyo, uh, Professor Chizuko Ueno. And our China expert uh, is a political scientist at Northwestern University, Professor Isa Ding. So this is truly an interdisciplinary uh, panel, and uh, each speaker will make some initial remarks, and then I'll encourage them to interact a bit with each other uh, before opening it up to a general discussion. Um, I should also tell you that following this event, there'll be, I think, a very nice uh, reception down the hall, um, and so you are all welcome to uh, stay uh, until the event ends, and then we will convene to the Doris and Ted Lee gathering room, which I think is uh, just at the end of the hall down here. Um, but first, a very few brief remarks um, of my own. As I think all of us are acutely aware these days, populist nationalism is of growing importance and growing concern across the globe these days, uh, not least of all, of course, right here in the United States with former President uh, Donald Trump's mega movement to make America great again. Um, uh, filling the airwaves yet again as uh, the presidential election campaign gets underway. It was not all that long ago, uh, 35 years ago to be exact, that the Cold War ended and uh, all around the world really uh, in 
the late 1980s, the early 1990s, really throughout the 20th century largely, there was widespread optimism about the global prospects for liberal democracy and international cooperation. In fact, it even, of course, prompted uh, the political scientist Francis Fukuyama to declare that the end of history had arrived. Today, that naive optimism has been overtaken by deep concern about the rise of authoritarianism and populist nationalist movements that blame both domestic and global elites for our problems and that champion national rejuvenation through international competition, even international conflict, rather than cooperation. The role of gender in the growth of populist nationalism is not at all well studied. And of the very little scholarship that exists on the topic, most of it is focused on the role of men and masculinity. Um, in the case of Trump's mega movement, for example, we have a few studies of the Proud Boys and uh, other macho paramilitary outfits. But the role of women is less well understood. And yet looking at the composition out in front of me here, um, the, role, the interest of women at least in this subject uh, seems to be considerable. And uh, this role is less well understood regardless of whether women actually figure in these movements as active participants or as subjects to be constructed and controlled uh, through these movements. In the case of America, it's interesting, I think, to remember that the Tea Party movement that foreshadowed Donald Trump's presidency was notable for its female leadership, including Sarah Palin, Michelle Bachman, among many other prominent American women politicians and political activists. And later on, during Trump's uh, presidency, the bizarre pro-Trump QAnon uh, movement targeted many, if not most, of its appeal, appeals directly at women, calling on women uh, to save their children uh, from the alleged conspiracies of corrupt and perverted elites. So women can play an important role in these movements as both leaders and as followers. But common to many populist movements uh, is a virulent anti-feminism that is often reflected in traditional views of the family that valorize uh, gendered inequities in the workplace, that often place restrictions on education for girls and women, also restrictions on access to quality medical care, including abortion services, and so on. The connection uh, of this anti-feminism to religious authority, uh, Hindutva in India, Catholicism in some parts of the world, fundamentalist Islam in other places, evangelical Protestantism here in the US. Uh, this connection to religious uh, authority often underpins um, these views with normative and cultural uh, justification. Um, today's roundtable will consider a number of the uh, many, many ways in which different religious, cultural, and ideological traditions and uh, also very different historical and political experiences have shaped uh, variable relations between gender and populist nationalism in these four different Asian countries. We'll be asking how tensions between nationalism and feminism play out in different contexts. Um, we'll look at uh, questions from Hindu nationalism in India to the comfort women in Japan and Korea, that controversy of wartime uh, Japan and uh, Korea. We'll be looking in the case of China at uh, questions from Mao's declaration that women held up half the sky uh, to the more recent Me Too uh, movement to try to probe some of the dynamic connections and also interconnections across uh, time and space. 
Um, before turning to the panelists for their opening um, remarks, I'd like to thank the co-sponsors of today's event, which include the Harvard Asia Center, the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies, the Korea Institute, the Lakshmi Mittal and Family South Asia Institute, and the Reischauer Institute of Japanese Studies. And I'd like to offer special thanks to Lindsay Strogatz, who is the Program and Communications Manager of the Harvard Yanjing Institute, who helped, uh, not only helped, but really single-handedly handled the arrangements uh, for today's uh, um, event with her characteristic aplomb. So thank you very much, <laughs> Lindsay. So, um, our format today will be to ask each uh, of the panelists um, to begin with um, 10, 15 minutes of opening remarks, and then we'll have some discussion uh, among the panelists themselves, and then invite all of you um, to feel free to raise your comments and uh, questions. So our first panelist today will be uh, Professor Tanika Sarkar, formerly chair of uh, modern history at the Center for Historical Studies at JNU, Nehru University in Delhi, and currently visiting professor at Ashoka University located just outside of Delhi. Um, she's written many books. Among them is a recent volume entitled Hindu Nationalism in India, um, and I imagine that will provide at least some uh, of the material for her talk uh, today. So please join me in welcoming Professor Sarkar. Thank you, Professor Perry and the Harvard Yinching Institute for uh, having me here. Um, it's a great privilege to be a part of this very distinguished panel. I wish I had been discussing, I were to discuss Indian feminisms, but since the panel is on uh, national, uh, populist nationalism and gender, I will discuss, I will talk about uh, profoundly right-wing but extremely dynamic set of women's organizations uh, that uh, belong to the fold of the Hindutva ideological apparatus. I'll explain the term uh, right now. Uh, <clears throat> Hindutva is emphatically not Hinduism, the religion of Hindus, though it claims uh, <clears throat> to represent the Hindu communities the world over. It is a political project of militant Hindu nationalism, which identifies the Indian nation with Hindus alone, and which casts non-Hindus in India as alien interlopers, uh, <laughs> enemies to the nation, national body. It also identifies the Hindu community and its interests with its own political party, the Bharatiya Janta Party or the BJP, the ruling party of India currently. So India is Hindu, Hindus are BJP, and BJP finally embodied in our Prime Minister Modi, uh, a series of recensions. Increasingly, therefore, any criticism of the party or of the Prime Minister is being represented as an assault on national integrity. And this is an argument which advances political authoritarianism, which is helped by a number of repressive legislations restricting freedom of expression. Hindutva possesses a vast and extremely intricate network of overlapping and intersecting organizations. At the apex stands Rashtriya Swamsevak Sangh, or RSS, Born in 1925, now about a century old, it has 38 affiliates and numerous, each affiliate has sub-affiliates, each with a women's front. And they cover 
a huge spectrum of social segments from army to farmers, workers, students, teachers, media, entertainment, uh, <clears throat> tribal groups, you name it, they have it. They work daily. These fronts work daily at these sectors and they have been doing so for decades. BJP is the electoral front of the complex network while the Vishwa Hindu Parishad or VHP coordinates Hindu temples, sects and priests on a global scale. BJP has ruled India for the last 10 years and is all set to return to power for a third term with a thumping majority. But electoral victory apart, it has a far, far wider agenda to completely reorder and refashion Hindu minds, Hindu common sense, and Hindu imagination. There are powerful right-wing organizations all over the world, many of them no doubt more aggressive and authoritarian, but none, I think, has such a long uninterrupted history. So many mass fronts and so entrenched, gigantic, so dedicated a cadre base. Its political intelligence is remarkably supple and versatile. The aim is to transform multi-community, multicultural, pluralist India into an exclusively Hindu nation state. They argue that the nation rightfully belongs to those alone whose faiths had originated within the country, that is, Hindus alone. Indian Muslims and Christians, they say, are not only alien elements, but they are a danger to the nation. Indian Christians had been, they say, a tool of British imperialism, while Indian Muslims are covert Pakistani agents. So a very popular slogan is, Mullah jao Pakistan, na to jao Kabristan. Muslims go to Pakistan or go to your graveyards. <clears throat> they have a one-dimensional historical narrative and very briefly, it says, across ages, Muslims have allegedly demolished temples, killed cows, and cows are, uh, well, sacred mother figures for Hindus, forcibly converted Hindus to Islam, and above all, ravaged Hindu women. Eventually, they demanded a separate nation state of Pakistan, thus vivisecting that holiest of female bodies, the body of the motherla motherland itself. Let me just give you a flavor uh, of their rhetoric by citing a paradigmatic text by their ideological guru, V.D. Savarkar, and I quote, it was a religious duty, religious duty of every Muslim to kidnap and force into their own religion, non-Muslim women. Muslims considered it their highly religious duty to carry away forcibly the women of the enemy side as if they were commonplace property, to ravish them, to pollute them, to distribute them to all and sundry and to absorb them completely in their fold, which increase their number. So this kind of claim is refracted through various organizations on a daily basis everywhere in India. The claim has no historical evidence whatsoever, but the rhetoric grips popular imagination. Rape tales circulate decade after decade, fattening on different temporal contexts. Imagine misdeeds of medieval Muslim monarchs segue into India's partition in 1947, the formation of Pakistan. Though Hindu and Muslim men had abducted and raped women in equal numbers, it is a recorded fact, during the civil war we had in 1946-47, Hindu rapes are totally excised from historical memory and rape becomes the defining feature of Muslims alone. The narrative performs several functions. From the supposedly evil Muslim kings of the past, it insidiously slides into all Muslims, dead, living, unborn, the past becoming present, continuous, and extending into the future. And that, in turn, produces post facto justification for Islamophobic propaganda, intimidation, and pogroms. The narrative is thin and repetitive, but RSS modes of dissemination are incredibly innovative, multifarious, energetic. 
It is the medium that counts, not the message so much. And clearly, women have a crucial symbolic role in this populist discourse. Now, I don't really know how to define precisely their gender thinking. On the one hand, they have very prominent women politicians, including our current finance minister. Women are active in their mass fronts. Each RSS affiliate has its own women's organization, though the RSS itself is an all-male body. Women organize their own daily sessions for combat and ideological training, which enhances their standing and bargaining power within the family and boosts self-confidence in public places. Full-time women preachers who abjure family ties and remain single and celibate are honored. Women ascetics have done much to inflame violence against religious minorities. And VHP women form motorcycle brigades to enforce moral policing in urban spaces. They attack uh, unmarried couples and block interfaith friendships and marriages. And they call themselves anti-Romeo brigades. Uh, love, uh, romance are dirty words. RSS homes too serve as political bases. They believe that political education begins at infancy and mothers should implant Hindu ritual and self-pride in their children, along with fierce combative urges. As Savarkar once memorably said, the mother should be a lioness breastfeeding her cubs amidst the bloody remains of a kill. That is the image of a very violent maternalism. Women's work is also largely informal. They spread their own version of daily news among kin groups, neighborhoods, yoga centers, workplaces. They improvise whisper campaigns about, they spread horror stories about so-called Muslim outrages, which they manufacture, rumors about impending Muslim attacks, Told and retold with toxic embellishments, these took enormous anger amongst the, the listeners. A woman member once told me, and I quote, they, that is Muslims, have raped so many of our women. Now it is our turn to rape their women. Note how in a single sentence she changes her gender. She is both the raped woman and the rapist man. There have been in the recent past, quite horrible sexual attacks on Muslim women during pogroms. I don't want to go into the details. Their organizations are two-pronged. One part is devoted to temple-related activities, to some constructive work at slums, even in tribal areas, which they visit occasionally and where their uh, male counterparts already have a base. So they are largely insulated from subaltern categories. They work among their own women largely. Uh, their organizational work starts with daily sessions for storytelling and games from, for small girls. They start with five-year-olds. And the stories are about bad Muslims and good Hindus. Stories we know are captivating. Listeners do not ask for their provenance nor question their quote unquote facts. The message therefore sinks in all the more smoothly and becomes an indelible part of the child listener's mental baggage. It becomes her personal memory. For older girls, stories fold into so-called histories of mis Muslim misrule in the past and their evil conspiracies in the present. Senior women teach them that Muslim men deliberately entice innocent Hindu women into marriage and conversion. Pakistan, they insist, trains Muslim youths in the art of seduction to attract naive Hindu women. There is, it seems, a persistent Hindu male anxiety about a deficit in Hindu masculinity, Hindu men failing to attract their women sufficiently as well as a deficit in Hindu female intelligence. Muslims conspire to marry Hindu women, they say, to fill their wombs with Muslim progeny, so that Indian Muslims will eventually outnumber Hindus, making India a Muslim nation as well. And they say the Muslims also deport them after they have had them reproduce a few children, 
they deport them as sex slaves to the Middle East. Young women in VHP trained to wield guns and they became adept at hate campaigns. They forced their way into schools to warn school children against forging friendships with Muslim fellow students, even though, even if they are girls. So women have much more than a symbolic role to play in national politics. They are ardent activists, invaluable assets to their organization. On the other hand, even though the first Women's Front was formed as early as 1936, the women, these women have never addressed patriarchal problems, never named them within Hindu society. They deny that there are any such problems, nor have they joined movements for gender and caste justice, nor indeed in the anti-colonial freedom struggles of the past. They advise, they excoriate notions of social justice, egalitarianism, feminism, individual rights as destru uh, destructive Western notions, survivals from our colonial past. They advise unquestioning female obedience to parents and husbands. They attribute family discord entirely to women's failures and rebuke divorce as a vicious Western import they criticize, uh, they refuse to criminalize marital rape on the ground that Hindu husbands can't ever rape their wives. And they recommend parental monitoring and control over their children's friendships, relationships, and self-choice in marriage. Even though an increasing number hold jobs nowadays, they say that the woman's primary responsibility is to run her household flawlessly without openly asking for the return of past Hindu ritual practices, like the burning of widows on the funeral pyres of their husbands, Sati, or the religious ban on widow remarriage. They glorify the quote-unquote chastity and courage of past widows who perform these deeds. So they endorse the value structure underpinning these ritual forms, even if they do not openly ask for a retrieval of these. So there's a profound gender conservatism that joins hands with vigorous female political activism, a very, very curious mix. If I have a minute, I, may I just mention one particular aspect. Hindutva weaponizes interfaith love and gives it a new name, jihad. Love becomes acts of terror, of hidden covert violence. As if Hindus and Muslims are two different species of being altogether. And love between them is a kind of unnatural aberration. It can't be anything else. Uh, the BJP government of the state of Uttar Pradesh, which has a Hindu monk as chief minister, introduced a law in 2021, which may well provide the template for a nationwide uniform civil code, which is on the anvil already. Conjoining two most intimate and meaningful parts of human life, love and faith, the act brings both under the purview of the state. First, it brands conversions away from Hinduism as necessarily inevitably fraudulent, the result of coercion or allurement. The potential convert has to apply first to the local magistrate to permission, for permission to convert, and the magistrate will take the final call on it, call on it not the person whose faith is at stake. A person who is accused of making unlawful conversions will need to, uh, uh, will need to, uh, uh, sorry, will need to uh, prove that he is not guilty of fraud, etc. If the magistrate decides the conversion is unlawful, then the offense becomes non-cognizable and non-bailable. Now, this influences marriage choices of Hindu women. Quite a few of them try to want to marry, fall in love with Muslim men, and want to marry them, and they also want to convert to Islam before they do so. The love faces incredible social ob obstructions, and the couple very often has to elope. The parents are then generously aided by the police, which forces them back home. 
But in an overwhelming number of cases, once the case comes to the court, the woman insists that both marriage and conversion had been entirely voluntary on her part. But that's not the end of the story because she's not immediately released into her husband's home. She's kept back at a home for women for quite a long time. Now, civil marriages have so far been exempted from its scope, but there is a catch because civil marriages have an obligatory two-month notice period to be served out from the issuing of the notice to the registration of the marriage. And two months gives the VHPV men enough opportunity to routinely track marriage notices and to inform parents that their children are going into an interfaith marriage and to let them coerce them back into the homes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, in numerous in instances, interfaith couples have faced bitter and fierce familial and social ostracism, police intimidation, as well as violent honor killings. At the same time, the law exonerates Hindus from charges of fraud, etc., when they convert people from another community. In those cases, conversion is named, quote unquote, homecoming, garvapsi. The law performs several functions. It violates Article 25 of our Constitution, which allows for the profession, practice, and propagation of faith according to one's conscience. By shifting the burden of proof onto the accused, moreover, it overturns a fundamental legal principle that one is deemed innocent until proved guilty. By classifying conversion to Hinduism as a return to one's original faith, it makes Hinduism the sole authentic religion for Indians. So yes, I'm just wrapping up. So what is the purpose of all this? Uh, in the widest sense, the law tries to block the will and decision-making capabilities of adults. They want to produce docile conformist citizens who learn to unquestioningly obey their guardians, their social authorities, and ultimately their state power. They thus internalize social authoritarianism as the natural order of things. And that in turn, socializes them into an acceptance of political authoritarianism. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, our next presentation will be by Professor Chizuko Ueno, who is Professor Emerita in Sociology at the University of Tokyo and currently also the director of a nonprofit known as the Women's Action Network. She's the author of dozens and dozens of influential books in Japanese, but also uh, a book in English entitled The Modern Family in Japan, Its Rise and Fall, and Nationalism and Gender. So please welcome Professor Ueno. Excuse me. Uh, how can I get my PPT? Well, thank you. Yeah, uh, it's my. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be among you. Uh, it was totally an unexpected surprise to be invited by the Yenching Institute instead of Raishawa Institute in Japanese studies. <laughs> so, so uh, given a topic for this roundtable discussion, I will talk about a twisted alliance among neoliberalism, neo-nationalism, and neoconservatism in Japan, and how gender matters in this process. And uh, the 1991 was a turning point of the Japan's turmoil. turmoil the, this year was marked with the following three historical events. One, the end of the Cold War with the collapse of Soviet Union. Two, the collapse of bubble economy in Japan followed by a long-lasting economic recession. Three, first testimony of comfort women survivor, which triggered a uh, memory war. Uh, before going into detail, uh, uh, I, let, let me show you 
uh, the geopolitics of East Asia. East Asia is the last resort of the Cold War where the divided state still exists in Korean Peninsula. There is a growing tension between North and South Korea with nuclear weapons. After Russian invasion of Ukraine, Japanese conservative politicians started to stress risk of turning the Cold War into the hot war uh, named Taiwan Emergency. The Japanese government considered China and North Korea as potential enemies for Japan. It's becoming more, uh, I mean, the covert uh, enemies, uh, which is used for an excuse of growing defense budget big enough to be ranked at the third next to China and Korea in Asia. Memory wars were triggered by comfort women issues in 1991. And this year, Kim Hakson, a survivor of comfort women, came out to make her testimony for the first time of, in history. It divides the national opinion between the conservatives and the liberal, uh, <clears throat> uh, whether uh, to see these victimized women uh, as sex slaves uh, with forced sex labor uh, or, or as prostitute working for money. Uh, this is a brief chronicle of comfort women issues. Uh, just skip here. Then memory wars was started between nationalists, neo-nationalists, and the liberals. It involves the U.S. citizens uh, with remote Nationalism, 1996, Japanese Society for History Textbook Reform uh, denies responsibility of the Japanese government, 2000s. Uh, Women's International Tribunal, Tribunal in Tokyo sentenced guilty to the late Emperor Hirohito for the first time in the post-war history. Uh, 2011, a uh, memory war of comfort women established, uh, the, uh, uh, I mean, memorial monument of comfort women established in front of the Japanese embassy in Seoul, as you see here. And in 2013, a replica of comfort women monument was established in Glendale, California and uh, uh, with a remote nationalism. And in 2019, documentary film by Miki Dezaki uh, called Main Battlefield. Then, at the same time, uh, the neoliberals reformed by the uh, ruling party, LDP, Liberal Democratic Party, was in process. Koizumi administration promoted structural reform uh, with deregulation of the employment, which resulted in the increase of irregular employment, uh, strongly gendered. Then, followed by Abe administration with alliance with a religious party, at the beginning, Abe openly said, my mission is to repair the national solidarity which was injured by neo-nationalist reform. In order to promote the national solidarity, they created external enemies, China and Korea. So anti-China, anti-Korea becomes a slogan of the neo-nationalism. They also created internal enemy uh, where gender and sexuality is targeted. Backlash against feminism and gender equal policy was rampant in the early 2000s. Someone called me, uh, I'm a, I am mean, uh, backlash survivor. <laughs> it is an irony that the neoliberalist administration encouraged women's mobilization to the labor market due to the labor shortage caused by extremely low fertility. They hope women must work, but at the employee's convenience. Uh, outcome is disastrous, increasing irregular workers and growing class gap. 
And uh, so this is the use of right-wing women politicians. Uh, two of them were militarist as former minister of national defense. Though they are anti-feminist and nationalist, one of them was assigned uh, even to the Minister of Promotion of Gender Equality. It's really an irony. In this sense, gender does not matter with a political stance. A survey proves that politicians, regardless of the gender, put the priority on their party policy, not on their gender. The outcome of the neoliberal reform was the following. Japanese women's labor participation and their productive age has increased rapidly and now excels in the European Union and the United States, reaching as much as over 70% of women are working. Accordingly, the double-income household uh, has constituted the, the majority today. Japan is no longer a middle-class society consisting of couples of uh, salaried men and full-time housewives. They need supplementary income by wives because average age wage in Japan becomes became low, as you see here, lower than Korea. The problem of working men and women is the increase of irregular workers with low pay and no job security, which is highly gendered. Now, over half of working women work at the irregular condition. Then, uh, in 2022, assassination of Prime Minister Abe by shooting took place. The criminal had an experience to work as an irregular worker. His family was broken and thrown into poverty because of religious fundamentalism uh, called Unitarian Church uh, coming from Korea. After Abe's death, a strong tie of the ruling party with a religious fundamentalist was made clear. The result brought by the political uh, failures are the following. Uh, one, growing class gap. Two, declining the, the birth rate. Uh, three, unchanged gender gap. Global ranking of GGI uh, is now ranked at 125th in 2023. Four, devaluation of the national wealth, uh, global ranking at four in GDP, and at 27th in GDP per capita. Now, foreign exchange rate uh, is very much unfavorable for Japanese yen uh, compared with uh, U.S. dollars. So I have a trouble traveling here. <laughs> <laughs> then... Uh, Jap Japan must pay the price of gender uh, discrimination. The, so the, it is actually this de declining uh, fertility rate, very much low. And uh, then uh, now, you know, the uh, birth rate is extremely low in Korea. The Japan comes the next. And the, then uh, what fertility means? If it's a sign of a sour hope of the future society among men and women of reproductive age, therefore, the low fertility means the lack of hope of the young generation. So this is the latest publication by myself entitled with Who is Responsible for this Disastrous Society? I give the subtitle to it, in order to transfer a better society to younger generation for which you don't have to say, I'm sorry. We try to change, try to change our society. You may be of a little help, but not powerless. Now it's your turn to change, was my message. In these days, I have opportunities to give lectures to high school students uh, to show 
uh, these gender statistics uh, about Japanese society. Recently, I received uh, quite a uh, uh, negative uh, response from one of the students, a high school student, a girl, saying, after listening to Ueno's lecture, I come to realize the society I'm entering is very dark. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for those words of caution. Uh, our next speaker will be Professor Hewal Che, who holds the Maxwell and Elizabeth Stanley Family and Korea Foundation Chair at uh, the University of Iowa, where she also serves as Chair of the Department of Gender, Women's, and Sexuality Studies. Uh, her books include a recent volume from Cambridge University Press that's entitled Gender Politics at Home and Abroad, Protestant Modernity in Colonial Era Korea. So please welcome Professor Che. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, I want to express uh, my sincere appreciation to uh, Professor Perry and also Lindsay for organizing this uh, wonderful uh, round table. Um, it's a great honor to be uh, on this panel uh, today. Uh, it does not begin. Okay, great. So in my presentation, uh, I'm gonna focus on the centrality of the nation state uh, in shaping gender norms and bodily practices in modern Korea. Like other East Asian countries, Tokugawa Japan, Qing China, Joseon Korea uh, shared a Confucian-inspired uh, uh, political imaginary that the family is a microcosm uh, of the state. Loyalty and diso uh, not disobedience, obe obedience to parents modeled loyalty and obedience to the ruler and uh, to the nation in the modern era. Beginning in the late 19th century, the new demands of the uh, modernity began to reconfigure women's role uh, in the family and by extension uh, in the nation state. There was a powerful family state homology. The discourse of civilization and enlightenment reimagined women's role as a crucial force in nurturing a healthy and productive family. And the idea of the family as the state with small ensured that the modernization of gender roles would be an integral component of the creation of a strong modern nation states. The value of women's domestic labor for the family was for the first time publicly recognized as an important part of the nationalist efforts to protect political sovereignty, build a strong economy, and preserve cultural authenticity in the face of imperial encroachment. In this context, modern feminism in Korea was never about women's rights only. It was deeply integrated with the nationalist discourse and activism. While nationalism is premised on the idea that it serves all members of the nation, history reveals significant tensions between feminism and nationalism. The newly uh, imagined role of women uh, in the modern nation state led to opportunities for women to receive formal education, work in the public sphere, and experience modern material cultures. Significantly, East, uh, Euro-American feminist thought and activism were introduced to Korea, and the phenomena of the new woman and the modern girl emerged in the early 20th century. I would like to emphasize there was a significant gap between the discursively constructed and oversimplified image of the new woman and the heter heterogeneous realities of the new women who were actual flesh and blood uh, individuals. However, what the popular media emphasized was the simplistic, stereotypical image of the new woman who was frivolous, hedonistic, and uninterested in national issues. They were seen as a threat to the stability of the family, which was the foundation of the nation. The pejorative, accusatory description of the new woman as westernized or sometimes Americanized have long been 
an effective tool for trivializing and denationalizing women when their idea and behavior offend or threaten the rigidly constrained sense of Korean uh, nationalism. Oops. One can see a remarkably similar phenomenon emerge at the turn of the 21st century when popular terms such as soybean, paste girl, denjangnyo in Korean, it is used uh, to refer to women who like to drink Starbucks coffee, eat at a Western style restaurant, wear foreign luxury brands, and date foreigners. What I read in this popular discourse on the new woman in the 1920s and 30s and the soybean paste girl in the 2000s is a collective anxiety about the loss of feminine virtue or womanly virtue, historically characterized by purity, devotion, sacrifice, and loyalty to husband, family, and by extension, the Korean nation. Some of the most dramatic changes to take place in South Korean society since the 1940s have occurred in the realm of the family. Industrialization, urbanization, and demographic changes, among other factors, have created a new reality in which things long taken for granted, such as marriage and childbearing, are no longer part of the natural life cycle. Among the young generation in contemporary South Korea, there is a popular movement known as the Four Noes Movement, which advocates no dating, no sex, no marriage, and no children. It's in the popul uh, populism that tends to divide the corrupt elites and virtuous people, the educated class of women has historically come under scrutiny and scorn. Moreover, in an increasingly globalized world, women's bodies in terms of sexuality and reproduction have become a critical element in populist ethnic nationalisms, which tend to vilify women who are unmarried and childless viewing those decisions of women as a threat to the future of the nation. Since 2013, South Korea has had one of the lowest fertility rates in the world. The public discourse on the low fertility rate tends to view it as a national crisis, linking reproduction to the national economy and meeting the need to, uh, for the supply of healthy, able-bodied workers to ensure the nation's economic prosperity. According to experts, the low fertility rate has many causes, including high rocketing housing price, prohibitive education costs, the rise of dual income families, and others. This is compounded by long-standing gender bias and persistent sexual violence and discrimination. The impact of social media on populist gender discourse and activism has been evident in the form of growing misogyny especially since the 1997 financial crisis when the Korean economy underwent major transformation along the lines of neoliberal economics, the so-called gender war has intensified on popular social media sites. Men complain that the low fertility rate is due to women's selfishness and lack of patriotism, and they blame women for Korea's growing economic insecurity and shrinking job market. Feminist critic Laura Briggs argues that all politics has become reproductive politics. She argues that reproductive labor is essential to everything. Politics, markets, race, immigration, gay marriage, civil rights, public health, housing crisis, and many other issues. If the low fertility rate is a crisis, we need to understand from whose perspective it is a crisis. Now, South, Korean, uh, South Korea is increasingly a multi-ethnic country with a rise of marriage migration, most promi prominently from Southeast Asian countries. Marriage migration grew out of a situation in which men, Korean men in the rural community, are unable to find brides. As a way to address this issue, the South Korean government instituted policies that would make it easier for foreign women to come to South Korea and stay there. There are a number of challenges that these marriage migrant women face uh, in Korea, but their voices have not been heard because they have neither the language nor the outlet to communicate. 
Here is a recent book, uh, The Stories uh, No One Knew, published by the Korean Immigrant Women's Rights Center, aims to capture the stories of migrant women in their own <laughs> words. In addition to sex, uh, physical and sexual violence, their bodies, the marriage migrant women's bodies, are treated as unpaid labor and incubator, incubators. And those who do not have children face disadvantages uh, in acquiring citizenship in Korea. Koreans often use the phrase, 우리나라, our country. When people say this, who do they understand to be included under we? Who truly belong to 우리나라? How does presence of a growing population of non-native residents play out in the face of a long-standing perception of Korean pure blood, which is a myth? How is the national membership determined not only by legal definitions, but also ethnic, cultural, and affective relationships. Multi-ethnic families in South Korea are a relatively recent phenomenon, but they have a significant implications for future family dynamics, a sense of a national belonging, and the place of Korea in the world. In a significant way, the low fertility rate and the rapidly changing demographics could be an opportunity. Although one requiring uh, facing uncomfortable truths, one, one such truth is that South Korea scores very poorly on the index of gender equality among OECD countries. South Korea's low fertility rate cannot be separated from the unfavorable social conditions that women face. It also cannot be separated from the long-standing centrality of the nation state, which subordinates other social agendas, such as gender equality, in favor of economic prosperity and uh, political solidarity under the banner of Urinara, our country. Thank you. And uh, our fourth speaker here is Professor Isa Ding from the Department of Political Science at Northwestern University. Professor Ding is author of a recent book from Cornell University Press that's entitled The Performative State, Public Scrutiny and Environmental Governance in China. And uh, her current work, uh, she's working on lots of different things, I think, but one of those is a study of environmental nationalist uh, movements, eco uh, movements, eco nationalism. So uh, please welcome Professor Ding. Thank you very much, Liz, for the introduction. Um, it's a great honor to be back here in Cambridge and to be standing here in the Thai Auditorium where I have sat as a student, audience to talks, and also taught um, as a grad student. Um, I have to uh, confess, I am not a scholar of gender, uh, not yet at least, uh, although I do live it. Um, uh, however, I am a scholar of nationalism, of populist nationalism. So in today's um, remarks, I'm going to puzzle through the relationship between gender and nationalism um, in China, in the PRC. Um, so the charge art session is to compare the intersection of populism, nationalism, and sexism in uh, uh, four Asian cases, China, India, Japan, and, and South Korea. So a obvious historical um, difference leaps out with the case of China. Um, while in democratic societies, populist nationalism is almost always associated with a particular right-wing party. Um, China as an authoritarian regime with a leftist ideology ostensibly lacks a right-wing populist party that's vying for power in democratic electoral uh, elections. So the CCP came to power through a leftist revolution in which female emancipation was a very important aspiration. Uh, Mao famously ran away from a 
arranged marriage, and many early leaders of the communist movement believed in sexual liberation. In 1931, in Jiangxi, uh, the party abolished polygamy and arranged marriage and established terms of divorce and alimony. Um, in the literature on the Yan'an period, we sometimes encounter stories of what looks like today's open relationships, although these relationships uh, almost always put women at a disadvantage. Um, in 1950, the party passed the first marriage law, which codified the marriage regulations that had existed during the communist movement. Um, and Maoist China, in principle, practiced equal pay for equal work, uh, significantly increased women's participation in education and the labor force, um, and extended welfare and benefited um, working mothers such as maternity leave and childcare. Now, none of this was extensive, um, especially in comparative terms. Um, so welfare under Mao was significantly restricted and more restricted uh, than in communist Eastern Europe, for instance. Um, I've recently read that maternity leave in communist Bulgaria was three years. Um, I think that might be a world record. <laughs> um, so after the end of the Maoist era, uh, two important events um, significantly affect, affected gender relationships, in my view. Um, so the first was obviously the turn to capitalism, um, which undermines gender equality on multiple fronts, from the wage gap to the collapse of the downway system, through which a lot of the welfare uh, services were provided earlier, to the commodification of women in both cultural and material spheres. And the second was the one-child policy. Um, despite its coercive implementation, it unintentionally improved gender equality in some parts of the country down the line. Uh, so Huang Wei, who was a PhD um, from the economics department here at Harvard, um, in his dissertation he now teaches at Beida, he finds that um, the one-child policy shifted spending in household disco disposable income toward the more female products such as cosmetics and uh, luxury purses. And not to say that men don't use cosmetics and uh, wear luxury purses, uh, but that is uh, his finding, which was one of the effects, um, perhaps a surprising effects of the, the one-child policy. And um, as a single daughter from the single child generation, I have to say that Growing up in China, in coastal urban China, I experienced very little uh, gender discrimination. At least that was my own experience. And it was usually my male cousins that were complaining that they weren't getting enough attention from the adults. Um, <laughs> so I moved to the US for college, um, but based on my observations and conversations with friends in, in China, women in particular, as soon as the single child generation reaches adulthood and enters the workforce, um, women immediately are overwhelmed by discrimination in all shapes and forms, be it discrimination in hiring, uh, you're explicitly asked, are you single? Do you have a husband? Do you have children? Are you planning on having children uh, in job interviews uh, to sexual harassment or uh, the lack of prospects for promotion? Um, so lacking meaningful, uh, meaningful career opportunities, some women return to traditional gender roles uh, in the family and others tacitly resist by staying single and not having children. Now, again, the comparative perspective is important. Having said all that, um, women advance uh, much more and much more often in business than in politics, in China in particular. So China, um, at least to statistics I can find, has the second um, highest proportion of female CEOs. Uh, I think Thailand has the, the largest proportion, uh, 30%, and China is the second in the world, 19%. Um, and so if, and I emphasize if here, so what happened in the early PRC period under Mao constituted a gender revolution, then in contemporary China, and I think the gender revolution is either incomplete or in retreat, um, especially in recent years under the new era. With the party's revival of traditional culture as a source of legitimacy, 
um, gender liberation quietly and conveniently dropped from the Marxist uh, ideology. Um, in a dramatic reversal of the one-child policy, the party is now encouraging women to have more children and to have children early. And, and obviously, the one-child policy was unique to China, but I think the parallel here are with the discussion about fertility, fertility rates um, in the earlier presentations. And um, this is where I want to bring nationalism into our discussion here. So in a flattened, simplified version of Chinese history, the CCP was a Marxist Leninist party that won a civil war against a nationalist party. But the CCP has always been nationalist, being a nationalist party, a movement from the very beginning. Um, its early leaders came out of the very same revolution as the nationalist leaders, the 1911th revolution, a nationalist revolution, some would say a Han nationalist revolution. Um, and the Chinese communist movement was a movement of national liberation. Its legitimacy lies in the success of this national liberation uh, movement against Japan. And since 1949, nationalism has ebbed and flowed, but it's always been there and it's been dialed up in uh, recent years. So the kind of populist nationalism that we see rising um, in democracies has similar manifestations in Chinese politics and in wider society. Um, but what makes the China case confusing is that because it is not a multi-party electoral system, there isn't a right-wing nationalist party in China like the BG BJP that we can easily associate uh, with the mobilization of extremist uh, uh, far-right nationalism. But to think about it differently, it means that the CCP, despite its name, might be playing the role of both a leftist party and a right-wing party at the same time. Um, so leftist politics in this case might not be inconsistent uh, with right-wing right politics. And this is a larger theme that I'm exploring uh, in my own research. So now adding gender back into the question. So what is the relationship between gender and nationalism in China? So. Not too long ago, uh, remember we were talking about the Little Pinks. Um, so Little Pink, uh, Xiao Feng Hong, was this nickname given to young nationalist Chinese women, um, and the group gained its um, uh, uh, notoriety, if you will, during the uh, last uh, Summer Olympics, um, and uh, uh, with them uh, over, you know, uh, climbing over the firewall to uh, harass foreign uh, athletes on their uh, under their Twitter posts, and then so on and so forth. So the rise of the Little Pinks um, was presented in the news media uh, in the West and in our classrooms as the surprise because the face of nationalism is oftentimes this angry uh, young man, but the Little Pinks prove that women can be just as nationalist, um, if not more. So I think nowadays uh, scholars are paying more attention to this phenomena in democratic societies as well. Um, I think in particular uh, in the case of India, and we've heard about this, and I think Anivan uh, sitting in the audience has his dissertation also on gender and um, Hindu nationalism. Um, however, um, not too long after the discovery of the Little Pinks, I think it was around uh, 2016, uh, around those years, the Me Too movement happened. Um, so the Me Too movement reached its heights in the United States at the end of 2017, and then it picked up in China a few months later in 2018. Um, so although Me Too has now subsided, uh, due to the pandemic, due to the trade war, uh, rising uh, uh, tension between uh, US and China and conflicts around the world, but the feminist movement itself has not. It faces many challenges. It's often associated, uh, accused of inciting gender opposition or even gender wars between men and women uh, uh, in China. And this accusation comes from both men and women uh, alike. Um, and then also with state crackdown on civil society, um, uh, be it LGBTQ movements or feminist movements, uh, the movement now has become what seems to me more like a counterculture movement um, that is more, uh, uh, has a larger presence online than offline. And 
What this all means is that in so far as the CCP is reviving traditionalism, um, and uh, it, it is then it is distancing itself um, from the kind of feminism that was oftentimes associated with Marxist ideology, at least in theory, if not in practice. Um, and in so far as the CCP is fusing traditional witlism with nationalism, uh, we are more likely to see feminist liberals rather than uh, feminist nationalists. And in this case, China might look more like uh, the other three cases we're examining here, and also uh, the kind of gender polarization Polarization, at least in the public sphere, uh, resemble what we see in Western democracies. So I think in sum, uh, China offers an intriguing case that complicates the conventional conceptualization of gender and ideology. Uh, women in China, as, as the case elsewhere, can play an important role in both nationalism and in liberalism, which is often, although not always, the opposite uh, of nationalism. And those are Thank you very Thank you. much. Um, I'd uh, like to turn to the panelists now, and I, I'd first like to raise a question to them and then invite them if they have questions and comments uh, to each other. Um, and then we'll open things up. As I mentioned earlier, there will also be a reception at the end uh, of today's proceedings. Um, so you're all invited uh, to join us afterwards for a reception down at the end of the hall. Um, so thank you all for, for very interesting um, presentations. And um, I'd like to start with um, a question about diffusion from one a country to another. We've been talking mostly today in separate terms about uh, what's been happening in India, what's been happening in Japan, and so forth. Um, what are uh, the political and demographic causes of uh, the current situation? But I wonder to what extent um, there has been diffusion from one country to another. Uh, Isa mentioned the, the Me Too movement and its diffusion from the United States uh, to China. And so um, I'd be curious to know how the Me Too movement played out in other parts of Asia or um, other examples that you might give of things that were imported into or exported out of the country that you're studying uh, to other parts of Asia. Mm -hmm. Professor Che? Should we answer it? I mean, should we respond to your question sure, sure, first? Sure, sure. Go right ahead. Yeah, I mean, this diffusion or um, influence, mutual influence is a really important part of uh, transnational uh, feminist movement and activism. For example, Sarojini uh, uh, Naidu, uh, uh, Indian poet, but also politician, was a hugely influential uh, to Korean feminist women uh, in the 1920s and 30s. In fact, one of the Korean intellectual women who studied political economy at Stockholm University in the late 20s uh, visited India specifically to meet uh, Sarojini Naidu and, of course, Gandhi, and uh, stayed there for four months, and etc. So the idea that uh, women politicians uh, preside over the uh, in the Indian National Congress in 1925 uh, was a hugely, I mean, it was an incredibly important moment of history. And Sarojini Naidu was uh, understood as a revolutionary woman uh, from Korean's point of view. Because I think Korean feminist women, um, they were very much integrated with this uh, nationalism movement. So some of the examples outside Korea uh, was a very important point uh, to be inspired but to learn uh, from the ex experience. And obviously in Japan, um, New Women's Movement, uh, Hirachika Raicho and uh, Yosan Akiko, all these uh, uh, women activists uh, were uh, <clears throat> very much instrumental in shaping Korea's uh, New Women's Movement, and et cetera. So this, uh, um, we need to explore more how they were connected, uh, probably not in person in many cases, but through print and visual materials. And I think that was the, uh, uh, kind of a really interesting and important part. Chizuko, um, would yeah. you like to respond okay. to Yeah, uh, I can point out uh, two examples. One is the, uh, about the comfort women issue. Uh, 2000's Women's Tribunal was made possible uh, by the transnational feminism. And uh, the uh, 
the Japanese feminists are together with the Korean and Chinese and uh, Indonesian and the other Asian feminists worked together to make it, made it possible and so reached that, that the uh, conclusion that, that to sentence the death to the, uh, the late emperor. And uh, so this is actually the great, con uh, uh, I mean, the achievement uh, of Asian uh, transnational feminism. The other one is the uh, Me Too movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, so actually, uh, well, back to the Kong uh, issue again, you know, whatever happens in Korea uh, should and could affect the Japanese activism. Uh, about the comfort women issue. It's quite strongly related to, to each other. Then, uh, next example is the Me Too activism. And, uh, so, uh, I mean, the, there's a, a committee ch of a uh, Chinese resident in Tokyo, uh, in Japan. And, uh, so, uh, actually when, you know, the Chinese uh, uh, women, uh, to try to uh, make uh, activism uh, of, of Me Too movement, uh, they cannot make, uh, I mean, a public space, civil space to make it possible. So in this sense, you know, that they brought it to the, uh, the Chinese community in Tokyo and uh, made it possible. And uh, as uh, the uh, Liz, uh, I mean, introduced me as, uh, I mean, the uh, chief director of the Women's Action Network, uh, we ran a website, uh, I mean, the, uh, uh, with the multilingual uh, pages, including Hangul and the Chinese. And advertising. Right, thank yeah, you yeah, very yeah. much. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so uh, actually uh, we have, a, I mean, the a Chinese speaking members as well. And when, you know, the uh, victimized girl, uh, Shan Zhu, uh, I don't know how to pronounce her name. So she is called as a Chinese uh, counterpart of Ito Shiori, uh, who came out as a survivor of the sexual violence in public and uh, she was brave enough to bring it to the court and failed but uh, at the, the uh, court uh, at the end of the, this you know the uh, lawsuit she made a quite moving speech uh, there and uh, so we brought it to our website and you can read it both in Japanese and in English you can check thank you Tanita yes. Thank you. I didn't know this about Sarojini yeah. Naidu and her, yeah. mm -hmm. that she had a, had influenced Korean women mm -hmm. in any way. Uh, India is a more insulated country. I think your three countries are more mm -hmm. tightly knitted together. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. But uh, Indian nationalism has been deeply influenced by Japanese nationalism from the early, 90, uh, mm -hmm. early 20th century. Uh, the, and there were interactions, cultural interactions, also with China, uh, but of a very conservative nature. Our past traditions, our non-Western cultures, our, you know, that uh, admiration for Confucianism, Confucian values rather than. Where China had a great influence on Indian politics was... Uh, uh, an important strand of our communist movements, which was the Maoist insurrectionary strand mm -hmm. uh, within the outside the mainstream communist parties, but uh, uh, largely underground, very powerful movements, which still <coughs> exist. Yeah. But um, they did not seem to have imbibed, and there's a lot of work on that these days, they didn't seem to imbibe much of the gender yeah. revolution that happened uh, you know, during the Civil War or in Mao's early China. Mm -hmm. uh, somehow that by, uh, they bypassed that and focused on the, you know, on the movements. Yeah. And, uh, so, um, I would like to ask you, ask three of you, Me Too, yes, Me Too movement yeah. uh, became a very important part of contemporary in the 19, uh, 2016, um, 18 and so on. Uh, but it wa got somewhat discredited by certain unsubstantiated uh, allegations by women activists against quite prominent men. Mm -hmm. 
of a progressive bent who then asked them to provide evidence and they would not. They refused mm. to and they insisted that if a woman alleges something, a misconduct against a man, it should be accepted without questioning, at least by feminists. So that mm. kind of divided up the movement and it, mm. it is no longer what it was for some time. I would like the three of you to, uh, uh, you know, to tell us something about the LGBTQ movements in your mm. countries and whether that led to a backlash or that has opened up more spaces because the BJP has a uh, rather strange relationship with these movements, which mm -hmm. I may refer to later. Mm -hmm. Isa, do you want to start down there? <laughs> I can try. I um, have to confess, I don't uh, uh, directly study these movements, but I do have um, friends who are um, uh, activists um, and who are familiar with these movements. And obviously in the case of China in recent years, you see um, a crackdown and obviously not just on feminist movements, LGBTQ movements, but in some instances in uh, Marxist movements as well. Uh, we had uh, 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 some students in Beijing uh, for be, uh, being arrested um, for that. Um, so it seems like there is obviously this, this dwindling of public space of civil society uh, for, for all kinds of them. And I think the other thing I would mention is I think two two things about the LGBTQ movement. One is that um, it, um, again, because I'm in the discipline of political science and usually our starting point, our assumption is that in democracy, you have all these things in authoritarian regimes, you don't have all these things. And the um, and, and typically uh, when I talk to people, they'd be surprised to hear that there is actually uh, LGBTQ movement in China. And then you could uh, actually be a gay person uh, in China, although obviously not always openly, but you could uh, uh, live uh, uh, that kind of life. There is space for that, there are communities for that. Um, and I think um, having um, observed, for instance, Shanghai, and especially uh, years ago, and I think there was a, I think Shanghai Pride was one of the uh, at least uh, 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 most liked ones. Uh, I think Singapore is the other one that people like to go. Anyway, um, I think that's one observation I'd like, I'd like to make. And the second is that um, I, I don't want to get into details, but what's really interesting is that the, the feminists and uh, 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 movement leaders in China, and then don't always agree with the, um, the LGBTQ movement. So there are also tensions between uh, uh, these movements and, and especially between the feminists and the LGBTQ movement. Um, and I think here as well. Uh, so I think I also observe that um, in the case of China, but I re really haven't really followed up in recent years, especially mm -hmm. since COVID. I think one of the interesting uh, transitions in the Chinese gay rights movement was in recent years kind of changing their narrative away from a kind of American human rights narrative to one that stressed family rights and the need for um, uh, developing support for families that had gay members in them. And that reorientation, I think, won them a lot more support within China and at least for a period of time bought them a little more sympathy from uh, the government authorities. Um, yeah, I think it's a you know kind of similar vein, maybe a little bit with a little bit of some different variations here. But in Korea too, uh, LGBTQ communities try to challenge uh, Euro-American century framework in understanding LGBT identity and activism, uh, rather than trying to modeling after or imitating. They try to figure out what's the local uh, traditions or cultures and the complexity especially a family-centered network uh, uh, in, in, in society. So that's kind of one part of it. I, I was, I'm kind of tempted to link it some more or less a decolonizing effort uh, to be away from Eurocentric uh, dominance uh, in thinking of a new movement. But also uh, since 1990s, uh, LGBTQ community has shown a little bit of some kind of progress, but one of the major barriers uh, come from fundamentalist evangelical Protestant groups uh, that have been really targeting LGBT communities. So there is a fundamental tensions and uh, it's still going on. Um, so religion uh, play a major role 
uh, in intervening and reshaping LGBT community movement in Korea? Yeah, it's actually a touchy question, difficult to answer. Uh, there are more and more sexual minority people coming out in Japan, becoming more visible. But in this sense, you know the uh, you, you know that there's uh, uh, I mean the uh, public bath in Japan, so that made the situation more complicated. So, I mean, the uh, people go going naked in the public bus separately uh, for men and women. And uh, so uh, trans uh, women, uh, I mean, should go to the uh, women's bus or not. Uh, this is the, actually the argument uh, caused uh, uh, quite a uh, strong controversy. And uh, so it's almost like, uh, I mean, the mock war, uh, the imported from the uh, Uni uh, United Kingdom, UK. I mean, uh, if you know that you have the more information uh, in English, uh, I mean, the uh, I mean, the, the controversy is more uh, conflicting. I mean labeling each other as a trans activist and as turfs. So it's a kind, kind of a replica. I mean, the reproduction of the, uh, the a conflict between the trans activism and the turfs uh, in, the United, in, the, in the English speaking community. So it's getting more and more complicated and uh, so just recently, last year, uh, I mean, the, uh, a, a, a law uh, which promotes the understanding of sexual minority, the name is actually very much strange, but uh, uh, it's passed at the diet, but uh, with a strong, uh, I mean, protest uh, by the uh, sexual minority activists. So actually, uh, in this process, you know that the religious fundamentalists are involved in, in mm -hmm. this issue, and in some pe senses, some feminists had the ally alliance you know, with those, you know, that the conservative people that made the uh, actually the situation more and more complicated. Mm -hmm. Would others of you like to raise questions? Um, oh, I, I, I was going to comment, uh, add a uh, another. Um, observation about the um, uh, the gay rights movement um, in China is that one thing that um, concerns me. I don't know if it's happened yet. Is uh, with Taiwan's liberal uh, uh, legalization of gay marriage, and I think um, uh, I don't think there has been research on that yet. But uh, my personal hypothesis is a big uh, part of the push was. Uh, the you know Taiwanese um, identity and 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 kind of differentiating their national identity vis a vis the vis a vis China vis a vis the mainland um, and then which really gave a boost to Taiwan's democratic liberal um, uh, movements and we do see this also uh, during the Russian Ukraine conflict in that uh, what I've heard and what I've read is that the gay rights movement in Ukraine, a very conservative society, has made uh, a significant progress because of their conflict with Russia. Mm -hmm. um, and so what concerns me, um, and I hope it is not a concern, is that would that how would that be read uh, in China? So on one hand, you can have transnational diffusion, um, you know, with legalization of gay marriage in Taiwan could uh, diffuse to mainland China and give a push to the gay rights movement. But at the same time, uh, you could also see um, this being a condition under which the Chinese identity, the mainland identity, um, also solidifies and, and to say we are not the, the liberal other. <laughs> right. It's not only the Korean Peninsula where the Cold War is still an issue, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. And so, I mean, both in Korea and China versus main mainland China versus Taiwan, I think, you know, going down these different gendered identities um, yeah. may yeah. have very important political implications. Give this one uh, question for all of us to think about. Uh, in some sense, the Me Too movement might be a kind of a really efficient lens to exploring some of the common issues we raise. That is, whether gender and nationalism 
has a, I mean, uh, I mean, you put actually gender and political ideology. In other words, progressive or uh, conservative political ideology, uh, how do they play out in uh, gender? I mean, my assumption and my observation is it doesn't matter what political uh, affiliation uh, a person is. Uh, uh, I mean, gender discrimination and the violence seems to be basically prevalent in all wide range of a uh, political spectrum. Me Too movement very amply demonstrates. Uh, for example, in South Korea, when Me Too movement uh, really started to take off, uh, major uh, transformative leaders, male leaders uh, in social movement were accused of sexual violence and uh, abuse. Uh, these are male figures, uh, whether social activists, for ju social justice, uh, equality, uh, democracy, and all that. So they were the kind of bearer of morality mm -hmm. for decades. But they are the one, uh, some of them uh, were accused, and actually some had to uh, stop their presidential uh, campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, presidential candidate, for example, or the mayor of the city of Seoul uh, was also uh, basically ruined, and etc. So to me, here is a thing, um, the lofty ideal of nationalism or national prosperity and all that um, is one thing. But when it comes to gender, it is always kind of a subordinate uh, agenda. Uh, it's kind of secondary and third. We have to wait until more important things uh, to take care of, uh, economy or political unity and etc. So to me, this Me Too movement uh, seems to really kind of uh, amplify the kind of the problems and complexity. Uh, yeah, I don't know what. Well, actually, uh, well, uh, I have a comment to Haywell. Mm -hmm. Actually, the uh, talking about comfort in the issue, I mean, the uh, as you said, you know, gender matters uh, is always, you know, that comes sec next to the uh, national issues. Mm -hmm. But uh, actually, what we did uh, at the, the Women's tri Tribunal in 2000 is that. Uh, you know, the sexual violence is not a trivial thing. I mean, the uh, women's uh, victimization by sexual violence cannot be neglected. Mm -hmm. So just stop making a, a pyramid of, you know, hierarchy of the victimhood. Mm -hmm. That's what we argued and insisted. Um. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think... Um, uh, well, in this sense, you know, you always know, nationalism comes first. No, no, no. Yeah, I, I think he's not disagreeing, I'm no, sure. It, it's yeah. not the kind of the, the similar point. Um, uh, I'm not saying, uh, uh, of course, gender is very important. Um, I'm feminist, mm -hmm. and, and I prioritize gender over other things. However, even tribunal, uh, even if there is a body, it is not substantial. Uh, it doesn't have actual uh, power to uh, put like emperor in jail, for example. Uh, in other words, uh, there is a lot, a lot of some kind of discourse and uh, activism, but what I'm saying is, you know, broader context, you know, broader historical context, uh, other issues uh, like a national prosper uh, uh, economic prosperity or political unity seems to, seems to get priority over uh, gender uh, uh, issues. Well, that's exactly what we, the, uh, we insisted you know, against. Sure, we do. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> the problem is you're not yeah. in charge. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Maybe we should. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I completely agree. I think nationalism is, if it's an ideology, it's the most powerful ideology we have. Um, and uh, when, uh, whatever comes into conflict with it, be it liberalism, be it feminism, uh, nationalism always wins. Um, especially, I think, um, uh, in situations of um, economic stagnation and, 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 and difficulties. Um, um, I think we might want to open up to the audience um, at this point. Um, so I'd like to uh, encourage questions, comments from the audience, and we have some microphones here. Um, so I'll ask you to kindly introduce yourself very briefly, and please make your questions also very brief. And um, if you want to direct them to a particular panelist or panelists, that's fine. So in the middle here.
Um, thank you for your talk. Um, my name is Jian. I'm a first year master's student in Harvard. Um, before coming here, I used to be in University of Tokyo for seven years, and I used to live in like the past decade in Japan. So I'll go first with the first question for Ueno Sensei. Um, so from my ex experience, my impression is that Japanese women, especially those in my generation I have ever talked to, were um, kind of apathetic about the feminist idea or the activism, um, especially compared to Korean women in my generation I have met in my life. So I wonder where that sentiment might come from. And I always think about um, Japan's bitter history of political activism in general, but I'm not quite sure whether that's somehow related to people's apathy, um, apathy about, for example, Me Too movement. Um, and second question is for most of you. I think you discussed how fertility crisis has occurred as a result of, of neoliberal economy as well as modern nation building project. Then my question is, if we take this fertility crisis as a sort of cause that leads to something in the future, I wonder how you think about whether this rising sense of population crisis may potentially force these states to change and respond to these stalled revolution in gender inequality, and whether you think this fertility decline is altering the way the national nation building project is intertwined or wedded with the gender revolution. Thank you. So, um, we'll take, I, I think, l let's take a few questions okay. and mm -hmm. then uh, turn back to the panelists. Yes, right here. Oh, thank you for the talk. Um, my name is Hannah. I'm also a master's student here at um, studying East Asia um, security and international politics. But I think um, a theme that I noticed is the usage of women's bodies as a vessel for nation building and the um, as a very strong, contentious political site for um, building nationalist narratives. And also, along with that, the violation of women's bodies as taken as an offense of that nationalist narrative and um, as an insult. So as um, I think Professor Sarkar also mentioned in her talk of how, you know, that rhetoric of, um, you know, sexual violence uh, between different um, religious groups also relating to the comfort women issue between Japan and Korea. So I'm wondering if that's a, an extension of an, a patriarchal kind of idea or domination over uh, women's bodies. And I would love to hear your thoughts on why, you know, women's bodies is so, it, it, it is considered such a political, you know, contentious site. Okay. Uh, Melissa, over there. Um, I'm Melissa Brown. I'm an anthropologist of Taiwan and of China. And first of all, thank you very much for your thoughtful considerations about this intersection. It's really important. Um, patriarchal, nationalism has been such a deeply patriarchal venture everywhere. And in the work that I've been doing, one of the things that I argue for Taiwan is that the great visibility of women, of ordinary women in public labor has been very influential in making Taiwan as cosmopolitan as it is today and has been at various points in its history. And so my question for each of you is, in your own countries, do you think that it might be easier for movements pushing gender equality to push nationalism away, as, as I think it's done in Taiwan? Or do you think that there might be other ways of fostering cooperation across ethnic groups or religions that would break the nationalism that might get your country closer to the gender equality that, that you might want to see? I, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Uh, we'll take uh, another couple of questions right here. No questions from any man. <laughs> You're too intimidated. Uh, thank Please. you for the talk. So uh, my name is Inan. I am a graduate student here at uh, Howard, studying East Asia. Um, so I want to hear whether you have some insights like to a phenomena, which is like uh, I observe in China that the Chinese government is intentionally or implicitly like uh, stirring up this anxieties of Chinese women marrying uh, and foreign men and especially the interracial one like so there is kind of like um wide like 
ans uh, anxiety about this among and kind of a pairing between manhood and nationalhood. So it's like this is like a kind of lead by the state and especially kind of endorsed by some state medium. So it's like so I want to get kind of present this question to uh, Professor Ding, but maybe like I also want to hear whether there are like similar phenomena like in other like uh, countries and also like how would you say like this kind of like political strategy or rhetoric? Yeah, thanks. Thank you. And finally, yes. Hi, I'm Shan Ni Zhao, a recently graduated PhD student from anthropology at Harvard. Um, because my current book project is study the Chinese state investment in marriage matchmaking, match, uh, marital matchmaking as a public service in urban China. So uh, my study has noticed that for the Confucianism inflated state pioneered by Singapore, but also like in China, Korea, and Japan, the state, our local government has been invested in uh, dating our matchmaking as a service for young people. So I'm wondering like in uh, your own country's cases, whether you have noticed this phenomenon. And if so, can you comment on this governmental practice and its effect? Thank you. Okay, so we have a lot of questions here on women's activism and passivity, the effects of the fertility um, crisis, um, ways in which uh, um, feminism might be used to overcome some of the problems of nationalism, issues of control of women's bodies, intermarriage, and so forth. And let me um, start by asking Chizuko if you'd like to comment yeah, okay. on some of this. Uh, Only uh, those parts that you feel like commenting on. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm <laughs> sorry, I can't answer all the question. but uh, for the first one, the uh, talking about the uh, feminism uh, among young generation like you, <laughs> and uh, I, I have the same opinion uh, with you, you know, uh, Isa, that, that that it was uh, mainly uh, caused by the un uh, unintentional result of the low fertility. With uh, you know, even though Japan doesn't have no one child policy, Japanese low fertility low fertility is just as low as China and as. Uh, Korea. So in this sense, you know, uh, what I saw uh, in common uh, with the uh, other East Asian countries, uh, you know, we, we, since we have this extreme low fertility, uh, there's only one child or two uh, in the household. And uh, girls, uh, act actually, in, in this very small uh, household, you know, parents cannot afford gender discrimination against uh, daughters. So in this sense, you know, the uh, there's an increasingly uh, high uh, education uh, rate among girls, and also uh, they are very much encouraged by their parents to take any kind of jobs and uh, uh, careers. And uh, uh, people like you, you know, now you are you are now the Harvard student here, with the support of your parents, I'm sure. So <laughs> in in this sense, you know, the. Uh, uh, you know, the, th those girls uh, who are raised just as equal as, and I mean, their, you, uh, I mean, their brothers and sons. Uh, now, you know, that the, uh, I mean, once they face uh, the gender discrimination, uh, they are very much less tolerant uh, to accept it. So that's what I see. A very much in common uh, with other countries, so uh, so my my explanation is this kind of the generational change uh, made a difference. And uh, talking about the uh, the second question, I mean uh, that uh, whether the this low this low fertility uh, will promote gender equality or not. So. Uh, in one sense, my answer is yes. The other sense is that, you know, it may be too late uh, to change a society uh, when, you know, the Japanese administrators and politicians come to realize the reality. So it may be a very much negative answer, but uh, I'm very much suspicious about, uh, uh, I mean, the uh, 
policy yeah, of the uh, uh, policy making uh, capabilities of Japanese politicians. And uh, the, about the third question uh, by the uh, anthropologist, and the uh, in in Japanese case, you know the. Uh, Feminism, Japanese feminist, feminism uh, cannot go along well uh, with the nationalism. Because uh, you know, nationalism always comes from the uh, patriarchal emperorship, um, so which is actually the symbol of the patriarchy itself. It cannot go together. Yeah. And uh, as for the, the last question, uh, the, I mean, the... <laughs> Uh, just recently, the uh, um, governmental report on gender equality uh, proves the very, very much high rate of unmarried people for the lifetime. And also, it gives us a quite surprising <laughs> data. I mean, uh, nearly two-thirds of men in their 20s and more than one half of women in the twenties are not interested in loving and uh, marriage. <laughs> <laughs> so, in this sense, you know, if we lose, we lose the uh, heteronormativity pressure uh, as a social norm. Uh, I mean, youngsters uh, may not be interested in marriage and having uh, a family. Yes, uh, about fertility for a very long time, India had the opposite problem of being vastly overpopulated, a population that the economy can't sustain. And uh, Indira Gandhi uh, had instituted male sterilization program very brutally. So, but recently, you know, we have this new urge of being the world's largest this or that, second largest economy or whatever. <laughs> so suddenly the claims are arising that now we have surpassed China's population and we are more populous than China, which is a surprising claim because since 2011, we haven't had a national census. So how do we know? <laughs> uh, but you know, we, we are very happy about the claims. <laughs> uh, about nationalism and uh, feminism, and I completely agree in India too, across the political spectrum, gender mm -hmm. has been a very low uh, concern. And it's a very routinized thing, to, a gestural thing that we must have gender parity, equality, we are all for that. But no further thinking, let alone. Except for the uh, southernmost state of Kerala where education, women's education, women's employment, women's, uh, the mother's needs and so on were actively taken up. Uh, but so there are some leftist communist parties still That around. is the, uh, that is in, <laughs> in Kerala. The world. Yeah. So they may not be in China, they're but in whoever India. whoever is in power in Kerala has pursued that. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, and though Kerala feminists themselves argue that that's one thing, to look after the economic needs of women, but cultural attitudes are very patriarchal. That's what they say. I don't know, mm -hmm. there's a mismatch. Mm -hmm. Uh, about, uh, I completely agree with that. Yeah. About nationalism, you know, uh, India was not a settler colony, but a fully colonized uh, country for uh, 200 years. So nationalism has a very deep impact uh, in many ways. And even when people, and I can think of only one person who went to China and Japan and the United <coughs> States in 1916-17 and warned against nationalism during the First World War, that was Rabindranath Tagore. And he said that uh, it's evil. It always leads to internal colonization or it leads to imperialist drives. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, it, nationalism has been ingrained in, I would say, in our political thinking, cultural thinking. And the, I, I'm afraid I would say it's not feminists who challenged nationalism in the way in which you would like to see that it challenged, but it were the Dalit 
untouchable caste thinkers who said that there had been an anterior colonization before the British yeah. came yes. and nationalism actually mm -hmm. intensified yes. that. Yeah. So and I guess in Japan also the Budakumin movement was very important yeah. with that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's quite so, deeply related with the uh, emperorship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to link this uh, fertility rate and the body um, as a very controversial but extremely important site uh, for politics and etc. I'll just say resilient patriarchy. I mean, certainly this low or lowest fertility rate could inspire government and the uh, legislators to come up with some solutions by providing more support for uh, future mothers or mothers and etc. But to me, this is a probably some kind of a, some adjustment to the new demands of the time. This is historically shown. Um, wherever there is a new demand, I mean, modern period, the exactly the same thing. Uh, women need to be educated to make a strong modern nation state. Women need to work in the workplace because there is an industrial development in here. Um, material cultures, women need to be consumers to provide uh, some in, in, uh, impetus for economic development, et cetera. So we need to really see what is undercurrents and what is really changing on the surface. But underneath, I don't see patriarchy changes, only the surface level. But I think, of course, the you know women go on strike, don't marry, do not give birth. Uh, this is a crisis, end of humanity, basically. That's the precise reason why woman's body has been so central in virtually everything. As I said, Laura Briggs said, reproduction, this is a kind of everything. Um, so in, in some sense, woman's body, women's labor, I mean, unpaid labor, and this body has been utilized to sustain dynasty, imperialism, colonialism, capitalism, and now the neoliberalism. Uh, so it's a very complex, but I think in some sense, uh, I want to be optimistic, but at the same time, uh, historical development also makes me very uh, reluctant uh, to see some kind of brighter side of it. Isa, do you have anything bright for us to uh, <laughs> conclude our panel with uh, today? I'll, I'll try. Um, so I'm going to address the Taiwan question and the interracial marriage um, question. So on Taiwan, uh, I'd love to learn more about the case. But my belief is that, and I actually look at um, uh, perhaps survey data when I go home tonight, but my belief is that gender equality is compatible with Taiwanese nationalism. Um, I don't see those, at least theoretically, in tension. Perhaps in, in real life, the, the movements clash. And the reason for that is um, gender equality, gay rights, those are liberal values. And Taiwanese nationalism is liberal, or at least claims to be liberal. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is why, um, uh, again, I, I use the example also of Russia and Ukraine, why you see uh, the advancement of um, uh, gay rights, um, uh, at least based on what, I'm re what I've been reading in Ukraine during the war, a very, very religious uh, conservative society. Um, however, this, um, uh, you know, those are special cases. And I think in um, most societies, you see um, you know, liberalism and nationalism clashing as opposed to fusing. Um, and, um, and, and in the case of China, I think that is the, uh, that, that's what we're seeing. Um, and, um, and, and on the question of interracial marriage and the pushback against and whether there is state media um, behind that, um, I don't know if state media um, is behind that, but I, I think this is a, a phenomenon that's observed everywhere um, in China, and I think you mentioned in, in South Korea, mm -hmm. and also um, I do research in Mongolia. Um, it's uh, even more intense there. So um, last summer, I was walking with a Mongolian friend uh, in downtown Ulaanbaatar, and then we were uh, told to not speak English. We're yelled at because they, uh, uh, this uh, guy who just came out of the gym, because uh, he was with gym bag, thought that I was a Mongolian woman, and my Mongolian friend was a Korean man who was in their country to, you know, uh, take their woman and take their land and all that. So, so, um, so I think this phenomenon you you really observe everywhere um, um, uh, in the world, um, and I believe there's versions of that. Um, in the United States as well uh, through uh, racial racial relationships and interracial marriages. Mm -hmm. um, 
Oh, that wasn't very bright. Was that? <laughs> I think we've had a very serious discussion uh, today, and I would like to thank all four panelists for really insightful comments. Um, and, and 